Hello Church. Welcome to this online service. My name is Lonel. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope you are all doing well. Valentine's Day was originally celebrated to honor Christian martyrs named Saint Valentine. It has now become a day that symbolizes romance and love. To many, love is selfish and self-centered, but we as Christians have the embodiment of love as an example to follow. God, whose love is selfless and other person-centered, sacrificial and boundless. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12, it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen the Father, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This week, we will be celebrating the birthday of Colwyn Harris on the 16th. So if you have his number, please feel free to wish him. Colwyn, I wish you a blessed year ahead. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne of glory, thankful for your sacrifice through which we are given life. Thank you for the example of love you have set for us to follow. Help us to be good stewards for your kingdom. As we will hear the reading and the sermon later, help us to meditate on your word. We ask this in your name alone. Amen. Good morning. Shall we pray? Praise be to you, O Lord, our God and Saviour. You alone are worthy of all praise and honour. How great your love is for us, that we can be called children of God. Thank you for your saving grace through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, please forgive us for our unbelief and taking our eyes off you in these difficult and uncertain times. Help us not to be consumed by fear and worry. May we draw near to you and trust in your unfailing love and faithfulness. Thank you that you carry our burdens and that you are always with us. Lord, these past months have not been easy for us. Some have lost loved ones and many tested positive for COVID. We praise and thank you for all who have recovered and are well again. Please comfort those who are mourning. We pray for healing for the broken hearted. May they know your peace which passes all understanding. Thank you that there is a decline in the infection rate of COVID. Lord, we pray for our church family at CCQ. Thank you that we can worship you through our online service. May your message reach out far and wide. We ask that lives will be changed through the preaching of your word today. Help us to see the needs around us and be generous in giving towards those in need. Help us also to look at ways to encourage and build each other up not only in our physical needs, but also for our spiritual growth. Lord, we pray for Jean-Pierre's mother-in-law, who will be having an operation. Lord, we ask that she will come through the operation well. Please protect her from COVID. Lord, we also ask for peace of mind for Paul, as he needs to have a procedure done in hospital this week. We ask for wisdom for the specialist and also protection for co from COVID for Paul. Lord, we pray for principals, teachers and learners as they return to school on Monday. We ask for daily strength and patience for them. May the learners settle down quickly since being away from school routine for such a long time. 
We ask that they will be well rested and excited about returning to school. Lord, we pray for the past year's matriculants as they wait for the exam results. We pray for good results and a high pass rate. Many are uncertain about their future careers as there are not many jobs available. We pray for the government and our State President, Mr. Ramaphosa. Thank you for the proposed plans announced to improve our economy and to create employment. May these plans be put into effect as soon as possible. Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of your word. As Mark brings your message today, may we be encouraged to live by it so that you may be glorified in all we say and do. Thank you for Mark as he faithfully teaches us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good day everyone. Hear the word of God as it's written in the book of Luke chapter 23 verses 26 to 49. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. This is God's word.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome wherever you may be watching from. It's good to have you. It's a very important part of Luke's Gospel this morning. I'm glad you could be joining us. Well, as the world celebrates love on Valentine's Day, we look to God because in the letter of 1 John, it says God is love. And Jesus himself, he said that greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. So as we look at the cross of Christ this morning, may our love be increasingly reshaped by God's love for us in Christ. Well, Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 49. Years ago, as a youth pastor at uh, Christchurch, Lucia, which became Christchurch from Schlange, I was once playing soccer with a group of my teenagers, and while to, tri to dribble past some defenders, um, my right knee bent inwards, and I heard what sounded like dry macaroni crunching, and uh, I felt excruciating pain in my right knee. An x-ray later revealed that I had torn my uh, anterior cruciate ligaments. I remember collapsing in pain, pain that I'd never experienced before. I lay on the ground close to fainting. <laughs> Eventually, I managed to get up and, and started to hobble off the field. And I remember, while hobbling off, a player in my team passed the ball to me. But obviously, I was in no mood or condition to play. In fact, I didn't care about the soccer game anymore. All I cared about was myself and my knee. Jesus isn't like that though. As he faced his death, while he is nailed to the cross, even as he draws his last few breaths, he is concerned for other people and their eternal destinies. The Gospel of Luke and the whole Bible points to the cross where we are this morning. This is where sin is forgiven and the way is open for sinners to become children of God. Well, before we look at it, let's ask for God's help to think about the cross again. Let's pray. Father, we know that Christianity is focused on Jesus dying on the cross. We hear it so often that there is a temptation to switch off. Please help us to not do that, because this message that saves us, and for some listening, it may have been many years ago, but it is the same message that we need to keep hearing and hearing often in order to keep going and keep focused as Christians. Help us to be amazed again that the creator of the universe died for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're not going to be amazed at the cross and praise God as we should until we realize what would have happened to us if there was no Jesus on the cross to stand between us sinners and God's wrath? Before he is crucified, Jesus gives us a chilling picture of what eternity will be like if he is not our Lord now. And this first point is quite a stark one. Listen to this. Those who reject Jesus will beg unsuccessfully for death one day I told you it's stark those who reject Jesus will beg unsuccessfully for death one day look at verse 27 of our reading a large number of people followed him including women who mourned and wailed for him Jesus turned and said to them daughters of Jerusalem do not weep for me weep for yourselves and for your children for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they'll say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? At Jesus' trial, he was declared innocent by Herod and by Pilate. But on that day, human hatred overruled all logic and justice. And the most righteous man who ever lived was sentenced to the most cruel death invented in that era, crucifixion. 
it wasn't just the authorities who believed that Jesus was innocent. It was generally accepted by the man on the streets. We see that from the criminal in verse 41 and the centurion in verse 47. Surely this was a righteous man. A large group of followers followed Jesus to where he would be crucified. And part of that group were women who were mourning and wailing for him. Maybe as mothers themselves, they were grieving the cruel way that he was about to die. Maybe they also knew that he was a good and innocent man. Maybe it was simply a religious tradition that they always did at every crucifixion. But rather than just think about what was happening to him, Jesus has the compassion to talk to this group. In verse 28, Jesus tells them that their mourning is misdirected. As terrible as the type of death Jesus was about to face, there was a worse fate lying ahead for the people of Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Luke, Jerusalem loses its majestic reputation as the city of God. And it comes to be known as, well, very shamefully, as the city of the unrepentant. They reject Jesus by and large. Because even though he'd been sent from God to them to offer them peace through the forgiveness of their sins. At the end of chapter 19, we saw that Jesus first wept for the people of Jerusalem. Because they had repeatedly refused to accept him as God's promised Christ. He was the one sent, promised by God, to make peace with God possible. And as a consequence, Jesus said that God would judge Jerusalem. Now that came true in about 40 years time, in AD 70, when Jerusalem was laid siege by the Romans. Eventually many died of starvation. After that, they were too weak to fight, and they were easily overpowered, and many more Jews were killed. Now normally, if a woman was barren, it was a case for grieving. But to describe how terrible that city's judgment would be, Jesus said that it would be the barren woman who would be considered blessed on that day. During the siege, it would be the barren woman who would experience the least grief because they wouldn't have their children dying in battle or infants starving in their arms. Basically, it would be so terrible that everyone would wish the mountains would fall on them and the hills would cover them so that they could die quickly. During the siege, those suffering inside Jerusalem would beg to die. In Luke 21, Jesus taught that the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70 was merely a taste, a, a foretaste of the judgment for those who reject Jesus because they would face the ultimate judgment day. Look back at Luke chapter 21, verse 26. Jesus said, men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So the judgment is seen as a picture of AD 70. But from here we see it is a much bigger worldwide judgment being spoken of. Back in chapter 23 verse 35, the rulers sneered at Jesus. During his ministry... Jesus had exposed their hypocrisy, but now they believe that they had silenced him. They thought that they had won and that he had failed. In verse 36, the soldiers join in with mocking Jesus. In verse 39, even one of the criminals next to Jesus hurled insults at him. All these people didn't realize who Jesus truly was. They thought with his hands and his feet nailed to the cross. His disciples had deserted him 
and his life is slipping away, they think that he had failed and they could now say and do whatever they wanted to him. They didn't realize that God's judgment against them was coming. And then their mockery would be replaced with them begging to die. Because of what lay ahead, Jesus was saying to these women, don't mourn for me, mourn for the people of Jerusalem. In verse 31, Jesus compared the way that the Romans were treating him as burning a green tree. You all know it doesn't burn well. There's still sap inside it. Remember, the Romans were not angry with Jesus. For them, his crucifixion was just an, an execution of convenience to stop an imminent riot from the Jews. But in AD 70, the Romans would attack Jerusalem in anger because of the Jews' constant uprising against them. That Roman fury against the people of Jerusalem would be like a dry tree being set alight. Now, it's not polite, hasn't been for a long time, to talk about hell. Even in some churches today, it's much more popular to only talk about the love of God and how much He loves us. Of course, God so loved the world, but for God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish. What is perish in this context? It's not to go to hell. The love of God is best appreciated when it is seen as saving us from the terror of hell, a place where people will finally receive what they were asking for their whole lives, for the one true God to leave them alone forever, and they'll have forever to regret it, and to realize that there is a fate worse than death, where daily they will beg to die, but receive no such mercy. So there is a terrible fate for those who mock and insult Jesus, and they do not change their minds about him. But did you notice that there is another group who were there that day? Look at them. There they are in verse 35. The people stood watching. They weren't verbally abusing Jesus like the soldiers and the religious leaders were. They were just standing there. They were watching. What was happening before their eyes was someone else's business, someone else's fault, someone else's problem. Jesus' death was interesting. You know, like watching the news about something happening on the other side of the world. But after that, they would go home, go back to what was really important to their lives, like work and family, home maintenance and friends. These seemingly innocent bystanders still misunderstood Jesus. They didn't realize that his death did involve them. He was not dying for his own sins. He was dying for theirs, and until they admit it, they would have to pay God themselves for their own sins. Christianity is not for spectators. There is no neutral party that is immune against God's judgment against sin. If we just let Jesus pass us by as a religious thing that we do on a Sunday, or some casual acquaintance, we have also misunderstood who he is, and his death will not save us from hell. Obviously now, if you have never sinned or done anything wrong, now this doesn't apply to you. You don't need Jesus. But if you have sinned, and the Bible says that all have sinned, we must own up and admit that we were accomplices to the cross. Because it was also my sin and your sin that put Jesus on the cross. But the obvious other side of the coin is our second point. Those who accept Jesus 
will be with him in paradise. Those who accept Jesus will be with him in paradise. Look from verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to me in, into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Two genuine criminals were executed with Jesus that day. They were obviously within earshot of each other. One criminal uses his last breath to mock Jesus and to make demands on him. But the other criminal, he used his last few breaths much more wisely. Look from verse 40. Firstly, he understands that Jesus is no ordinary man. He knew that there was a special connection between Jesus and God. When the other criminal mocked Jesus, this criminal rebuked him saying, don't you fear God? He knew that God takes it personally and seriously the way people treat Jesus. Secondly, he confesses that he is guilty, that he is a criminal. He admits that because of what he has done, he is a sinner. He deserves his death sentence. Thirdly, he acknowledged that Jesus had done nothing wrong. He knew that Jesus was not dying for his own sins. And fourthly, he acknowledges that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't a failure. It was accomplishing something great from God. He knew that Jesus' death wasn't the end because he admitted that Jesus would be going to his kingdom. And he would be the kingdom that he had been preaching about and calling other people to join him in. If this criminal calls the kingdom Jesus' kingdom, he's admitting that Jesus is the king of that kingdom. Others in the past have asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hand in this kingdom. But this humble, repentant criminal simply asks Jesus if he would remember him when he comes into his kingdom. He sincerely believed that this man dying next to him had the power to save him. The king is close to death, but he still has the strength to think about others. And he assures this criminal in verse 43, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. No baptism, no confirmation, no tithing or church attendance required. On the spot, Jesus promises him eternal life in his kingdom. A wicked sinner is welcomed into paradise, a place where only righteous people are allowed. His trust in Jesus meant that his sins were forgiven because as the prophet Isaiah had said over 700 years earlier in chapter 53 verse 5, saying the following, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, Jesus has shocked us so far in Luke's gospel when he points out godly role models. It's been the tax collector with a simple prayer at the back of the temple. It's been Zacchaeus, the hated chief tax collector, who paid back four times as much as he extorted from people. It's been a poor, insignificant widow who gave two small coins at the temple. And once again, the role model in this passage is unlikely. A serious criminal 
because only serious crime was punishable by crucifixion. Now, this criminal understood the greatness and the power of this man besides him. He doesn't expect Jesus to deliver him immediately from his death and his pain. He understands that those blessings are part of the coming kingdom. This criminal who was so close to being eternally condemned is like a dry branch snatched from the fire by Jesus. This reminds us that while we still have breath in our bodies, whoever you may be, it's not too late to humble ourselves before Jesus and confess that we need him to die for our sins as well. Wherever you are, he will hear you when you call out to him. It also reminds us that there is no sin that is too wicked to forgive if we humbly ask Jesus to forgive us. Look at Jesus' selflessness in verse 34. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Here, Jesus is asking God to forgive the people around him who were mocking him, sneering at him, torturing him to death. These were the people who happily had a hand in Jesus' illegal death sentence. But Jesus asked God to forgive them because they didn't really know what they were doing. Do you see that there's forgiveness when we confess our ignorance? When we realize who it is that we have ignored or hated, when we realize that we have misjudged, misunderstood, or underestimated Jesus Christ, even if we've done it our whole lives, he still offers us forgiveness. What a wonderful God we have. Our final point is that the Christ had to die to open the way to God. The Christ had to die to open the way to God. Look from verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. The constant mockery from those who thought they understood Jesus is in verse 35. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, that was the ruler's. It's also from the soldiers. Look at verse 36. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Even when close to death, the criminal in verse 39 said, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. What a temptation that must have been. Jesus could have easily come down from that cross and ended all his pain and suffering. If we think of our own pain threshold, as I spoke about mine and that soccer injury. If you could, wouldn't you have taken revenge on those cruel, godless people around you and gone back to the perfect fellowship and, and bliss that you had with your Father in heaven? But Jesus chose to endure the cross, scorning its shame, because he knew that it was the Father's will, and it was the only way for our sins to be forgiven and for us to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Out of love and obedience to God, and out of love for us, Jesus let himself be crushed for our sins. He understood that as the Christ, he had to suffer and die, not save himself, Rather, in verse 46, even to his last breath, Jesus isn't thinking of himself, 
Rather, he commits his spirit into God's hands. God even gave evidence that the cross worked. At the cross, creation reflect the significance of what was happening as darkness fell over the whole land. Darkness was a sign of God's judgment over the world. So before the exodus, darkness, if you remember, was the ninth plague before the Passover lamb was sacrificed, when the Israelites were rescued and the Egyptians were judged. The massive curtain in the temple that symbolized the separation of a holy God and unholy people was torn in two. Jesus' death was the once for all offering to God that took away the need of a temple, priests, or sacrifices for sins that separated us from God. The torn curtain symbolized that for we who believe, there is nothing bad between us and God anymore. Now we can approach him as our father and he will recognize us and welcome us as his forgiven and adopted children. In verse 47, we see that the way to God isn't only open to the Jews. Even a Roman centurion, Gentile, praises God and says, Surely this was a righteous man. Jesus has opened the way to God for every person who will recognize that Jesus is who he said he is. Now, the, the very popular metal band Metallica also misunderstand I think to this day who Jesus is listen to these words from one of their songs it's about Jesus and Christianity the chorus goes as follows broken is the promise betrayal the healing hand held back by a deepened nail follow the God that failed how foolish it wasn't the nails that held Jesus on the cross. It was his will to save us from our sins, that the sins that condemned us to an eternity to hell. How foolish to mock the only way of salvation. We must understand this. Through Jesus offering himself, the way to God is open. God has laid down his life for sinners like us everything we ever did wrong past present and future is put on the sun and he dies on the cross all jesus goodness and righteousness is given to those who will believe in him please make sure that you haven't let jesus pass you by humble and joyfully accept his amazing grace to you and you too will be with Jesus in paradise. If you have confessed that Jesus needed to die because of you, keep loving him for his deep love towards us. Love him with all your life. Love him more each day and never let that love grow cold. Let's pray. Father, we confess that it was our greed and pride that made Jesus' death necessary. For this we are truly sorry. We thank you that it was your love for us that held him on the cross when we stand before you on Judgment Day. Please look on the cross and not on our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. God bless.